Thanks to West Coast Sheen for having me here, and thanks to the previous speakers um, for reminding us that the stuff that I'm going to talk about here is, continues on in, in different forms um, today, and that um, it's, people still continue to fight back. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I've been doing research into the black history of this province for about 15 years now, and, uh, and Vancouver in particular. Uh, and particularly a, a little neighborhood called Hogan's Alley that was in the East End uh, and is right where the Georgia Viaduct is today, uh, which was the nucleus of the original black community of, of Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> over the years of doing just various work around this topic, um, I wrote for a bunch of different sources uh, in a bunch of different ways, um, sort of ad hoc over the years. And uh, what I did when I went to put together this, my latest book, which is, is called After Cain, uh, which is a book of seven essays, I put all of the writing that I've done on Hogan's Alley and Blacks in Vancouver into one essay. And um, it's the longest essay in this book. And it's, um, it, as far as I know, it's the longest, single longest piece of writing, um, single longest historical work on Blacks in Vancouver. So there, have, there has been a, a, a book of, um, uh, black history in, in the province that goes back to the 19th century. But the black history of uh, Vancouver has not really been written yet um, in a comprehensive way. And hopefully somebody will come along and do that. I, I do focus on this particular neighborhood. It was sort of the uh, where the majority of blacks in the city lived in the middle of the 20th century, but there, there are other black experiences around the city as well too, and that, that should be acknowledged. <coughs> I'm also going to show some images, and, and um, I'm not going to read from the essay. I find reading an essay doesn't work that well. It's better, I think, to talk uh, extemporaneously like this. So I have a, a way of guiding my, myself through this talk, but I'll keep it relatively short, and hopefully there will be a, a bit of a chance to um, answer some questions and have a bit of a dialogue. I think often that's where the really interesting ideas come out anyway. Um, what I'm going to do is give a talk that runs through a kind of old but tried and true formula, and that's the, the who, what, where, when, and why, which is as good a way as any of organizing all of the stuff that I've gathered in my head on this topic over the years. Um, so the title there is Vancouver versus Hogan's Alley, Urban Renewal, Negro Removal, and the myth of livability, and um, those topics will come up as we go along. But the first is who, uh, and that's who, who was the, uh, the black community of Vancouver in its origins. Um, it was a group of people who, who came here, not so much uh, as part of that original group that came to, to BC in the 19th century, um, although some of the black pioneers from Victoria um, uh, came over to Vancouver, and that was sort of one stream. Um, but another stream was from the, the U.S. That was probably the largest one. So lots of folks that came up from the States, including Vancouver's most famous black family, which would have been the, the Hendrixes. This is Jimmy's grandmother. Um, another stream came from Alberta. So a lot of folks who were originally from the States themselves came up from Oklahoma to, and settled places like Amber Valley in northern Alberta. Uh, a lot of them came out to Vancouver during the 1930s, during the Depression. And so a lot of the old families are, are from Alberta as well, American derived. But a lot of this immigration is before the later uh, immigration waves that came from the Caribbean and from Africa. Um, Nora Hendricks there is a pretty good example of, of uh, that group of people being American derived, working class, um, a lot of them kind of mavericks in a way, people who sort of who, who stepped out of uh, out of the frame in some kind of way and decided to move to this crazy place with very few black people. I often wonder what kind of personality trait it takes to do something like that. But these were folks that were, were brave enough to do that. Um, a lot is made of Jimi Hendrix, but I always say that Nora was the real star of the black community here. And uh, she was someone who uh, helped to establish the, the first uh, black church, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, a few things, too, about uh, women in the community. So. Uh, if you look at the pioneers that came from during the gold rush era to Victoria, a lot of those migrants uh, from that, that wave of black immigration were male, and um, not so many women. This this migration stream was different, and it was families coming up, and so there were a lot of women in the community, 
It wasn't one of those sort of bachelor communities of, of immigrants. Um, it did coalesce because of uh, the job ghetto of porters, so black men who were porters, and that's why Hogan's Alley's right next to the train station. Um, but the, the ones who created the most lasting institutions in the community were the women. So there were a series of what they call chicken houses, which are restaurants that sold southern fried chicken in the, in the community. Uh, Vi Moore was probably the most famous one. She had a place called Vi's Chicken and Steakhouse that was right down in Hogan's Alley. But there were a whole, whole archipelago of these different um, um, woman-owned uh, restaurants that were in the community. Also, some of them doubled as, as bootlegging places, speakeasies, and after hours. Uh, also, the church. The church was largely established by the women of the community, and that was a long-standing institution. Um, they shut it down just shortly after Nora Hendricks uh, finally took sick. She lived a very long time, as you can see. Um, and, okay, what was it? So, what was the neighborhood like? Um, it's a little bit confusing. Often people call it a black neighborhood, and I correct them and say, um, it's not quite true. It was a, a multi-ethnic neighborhood. Uh, I often say Italians can call Hogan's Alley their original neighborhood too in the city, because it was a, an Italian enclave. It was right next to Chinatown as well. So it was really intermixed, and there were all sorts of people who lived there. It was basically an immigrant enclave. The reason why it gets described as a black neighborhood, when we say it's that, is because the majority of blacks in the city lived in that neighborhood at the time. Um, there's also a little bit of a debate about Hogan's Alley proper and the East End. And so when you talk to some of the elders, they, uh, they like to remind us that, well, Hogan's Alley was sort of one section of it. And really, folks lived all through the East End. Hogan's Alley itself kind of had a series of institutions. The church was there, Vise was there, some of the other uh, nightclubs were there. And so it was sort of like maybe the commercial, um, the most well-known aspect of it commercially. But people lived kind of all around it through the East End, through Strathcona. Um, still, it was a sort of pseudo-segregation, so um, there was no official segregation against the black community in Vancouver the way there was against First Nations people and Asians. Um, so there was no law on the books that said blacks couldn't live here or there. Um, <clears throat> but I call it pseudo-segregation because there are all sorts of stories of people saying basically you couldn't rent anywhere in the city just because of racism, so an unofficial kind of segregation existed. And this was the neighborhood where you could go rent somewhere and people would leave you alone. And it was that neighborhood where it was sort of an ad hoc group of immigrants from all different places. Um, and at the edge of Chinatown, that's part of it too. So um, pseudo-segregation is the best way to, to describe that, I think. Um, it may also explain why there, was, why there was some fluidity out of the neighborhood later, but I'll get to that. Um, during the 1930s, a lot of the writing that went on about Hogan's Alley in the, in the province in the Sun uh, referred to it as a slum. It ultimately fell victim to a program that, was, that called itself slum clearance. Uh, it was described that way over and over again. Um, now, whether or not it was a slum, when you talk to the elders, it's interesting, you get sort of different stories from different people, and some people say, yeah, it was a slum, and you're lucky not to have lived there, and I'm glad I'm out of there, and, you know, stop talking about it. All the way over to other people who are saying, well, you know, it was poor, but it was like a, uh, a village in a lot of ways, because you knew everybody. And, you know, yeah, there was some violence and some crime, but there was also this church there. There was also families that grew up there, uh, hardworking people, and all sorts of different things, right? It was a whole community that lived there. Um, so just to call it a slum is inaccurate. Um, so it, it was a poor community, that's without doubt. Um, it was working class. Uh, there was some crime there. But a lot was made of that in the papers. In a way, it seems like the only time people ever wrote about Hogan's Alley was when it was, uh, when there was either a high-profile crime that happened there, uh, or they were talking about bulldozing the place because of the crimes that were happening there. Those are the two news stories that you see most commonly. So to find out what went on, you really more have to talk to people and, and, um, and read between the lines of what else was happening. Um, a little bit of, of, about the name, too. Um, <clears throat> Hogan's Alley, uh, there are a bunch of different stories about where the name came from, but uh, it seems that the most accurate one is that there was a, a comic strip in the 19th century uh, called Hogan's Alley, and another one called The Yellow Kid by um, uh, an artist named Outcult, who was an Anglo-American um, 
comic strip artist. He kind of invented the form of comic strips in a way. And um, Hogan's Alley and his comic strip was this Irish neighborhood. So this is the time before Irish people were, were, were uh, unanimously considered white. So this is back when there was this immigrant population that were not considered model minorities. And, uh, um, and really, we're not totally accepted as, as white Americans, right? And, uh, and so he has this, this um, imaginary neighborhood in Hell's Kitchen, New York, called Hogan's Alley, that's this completely chaotic you know, scene of urban squalor. I have a picture of it. And that's it there. So the caption is, what they did to the dog catcher in Hogan's Alley, which is kick his ass, apparently. Um, but this became a kind of euphemism for slum, for a wild, chaotic neighborhood, kind of um, crazy place where things are out of control all across North America. So you actually see Hogan's Alleys in a bunch of different places because it was this sort of generic term for the part of town that you should go to. Um, and, and it was also Hogan's Alley in, in, in Rossland here in, in D.C., um, which was the red light district there, apparently. So, and I think that the, uh, is the FBI or the CIA, their shooting gallery, so where they train people to, where they train their agents to, to shoot, is called Hogan's Alley. They call it Hogan's Alley, where you get citizens popping up and criminals and they're supposed to shoot the guy with a knife and not the woman with the baby or whatever. Um, they call it Hogan's Alley. Anyway, so it was this epithet originally. It's, it's come to be the, the, the term for the neighborhood. It sort of got lost in time, I think, as uh, the comic strip stopped appearing, and um, and that's the name that we have for it now. Uh, where was it? So, I'll show a map. It's um, that's the area. So this is one of the archival um, maps of the neighborhood. So I'll just step over here. So, so there's Gore. That's Union Prior. Main Street is right here, so it's not like this anymore. Um, you know where you are? The Georgia Viaduct sits here right now. Right? That's where the Georgia Viaduct uh, off ramp is, right? And it connects on to Prior Street with Venables. So there's a, that new condo is there. Um, there's the Jimi Hendrix Shrine is right there. All this stuff is gone as well as this. This is that green space. It's not actually a park. People think it's a park, but it's actually owned by the city, not the parks board. Because it was supposed to be uh, the rest of this freeway plan uh, that was going to cut Chinatown in half. It doesn't exist there because they stopped it. But not before they wiped out Hogan's Alley. This was the, the heart of Hogan's Alley. People get confused sometimes about whether or not it was it was this, it was running north-south, or this east-west thing. Well, it was both. It was this T-shaped part right there. And it carried on. Um, where it kind of stopped being Hogan's Alley, which was an unofficial name, right? Um, it seems to be about here. This is where the church was. And just from kind of oral histories, people say that uh, most of the black families lived here. There's a, a couple of apartment buildings here that were mostly black. Um, sort of say that was kind of the Italian end more. It's just sort of the black end. But there, that's really porous, actually. So Vi's Chicken and Steakhouse was over here. Um, the Porter's Quarters was here. That was really way back before World War One. That was really the origins of it as a black site. There were the, the Porter's Union had a, uh, a uh, kind of like a way station for black porters who didn't have a place to stay when they hit Vancouver. So they would stay there. Um, and that's probably why it became associated with uh, the black community. <coughs> Uh, now, so that, that is, I think, why it's there. It's because if you, you look sort of down, um, down where the map is from there, you get the train station. And so this is sort of the place where people will first hit, I guess, if they've uh, gotten off that train. And, uh, and that's where they end up staying. Um, I'll speak a little about that freeway plan because it came up. So uh, that plan goes way back. They were, uh, they were planning to put some kind of uh, interurban freeway in Vancouver um, going back into the 40s. Um, exactly how it was going to look uh, was a little uncertain, but the plan sort of coalesced over the years and it dovetailed at a certain point with this, this concept of slum clearance um, and it became this really unholy uh, um, confluence of different ideologies. So on the one hand, 
Um, this idea that in order to improve a people's neighborhood, you should knock down all their houses and put up some high rises that they should go live in. This was the, the ideology that, that they called urban renewal that happened all across uh, North America. And um, uh, it's, it's responsible for creating the projects in the state, so the infamous projects like Cabrini Green and places like that, um, you know, widely known as a, as a failure of social planning, right? Um, this happened in just about every neighborhood in, in every city in North America in one form or another. Invariably, it happened to a, uh, um, a black community or a Chinatown. I haven't found a place uh, where it didn't happen in a poor neighborhood. Um, and it is really uniform. So basically, there, it's this switch to the, the car. So this is the same period when they're ripping up streetcars and they're s switching everything over to the car. And people are expected to live in the suburbs and commute to the city. It's a huge social shift, right? Uh, and so they decided, well, we have to have a freeway running, connecting the suburbs to the city. Where do we put it? Put it in the poorest neighborhood, in the neighborhood that's least able to defend itself, um, in the black neighborhood. And that happened here, uh, exactly according to that plan. Right now, it's it's not talked about. Nobody will cop to it. It's not you're not going to find anybody say this was the plan. But it's just the uniformity of how it took place all across the continent it makes it pretty clear how it worked. Um, now in Vancouver. Things didn't quite go according to the plan. Uh, they had this, this huge eight-lane freeway that was supposed to sweep from First Avenue to Clark, Clark to Venables, up prior. This was the uh, on-ramp to the part that went downtown. But it was also supposed to dogleg through Chinatown, rip Chinatown in half, and go all the way to the uh, Burrard Inlet. And there was even a, a proposed third crossing of the inlet that was going to be there, either a tunnel or a bridge. Um, now, none of that happened because the community got up in arms and stopped it when these plans saw the light of day. They were tried to keep it as secret as they could over the years. Uh, bits and pieces leaked out. People knew something was up because they were passing a series of bylaws that made it, um, that uh, outlawed people from making certain improvements or then putting curbs in and things like that. And all this area where you see a bunch of people live was designated industrial during this era. And you see it's, it's all houses, all housing lots, right? It's not industrial industrial land. Um, but that was part of the plan to sort of um, edge people out. And they actually did build projects here in Vancouver too. So the McLean Park projects and the Rainier project were built because of this. Right? So the idea was everybody living here will go live in those. Um, exactly the same plan as in the States. Now what was different here was um, one, they did it late. It took them a long time to get it started. Partly maybe in the way Canada copies things from the States, but <laughs> 10 years later, basically that's what happened. So by the time they were trying to initiate this plan, it was the 60s. And people were, instead of the 50s or 40s, when they were doing these things in New York and, and other big American cities. So people were very empowered. It was a different era. It was after the Civil Rights Movement, right? And so um, people weren't having it. And um, there was an organization called SPOTA, the, the um, Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association, that uh, spearheaded this campaign. Um, and they stopped it. So now that's sort of the story that you hear most often. That's the myth of livability that I'm talking about. So if you hear Harcourt, Mike Harcourt, tell the story, um, he saved Vancouver, right? And it's paradise. Now. Things like that. That's a book title. Um, City Making in Paradise. Well, what they don't mention is um, that you know, this is the part of the plan that did go ahead, right? So they, they struck ground and started knocking these places down, expropriating these buildings, going back to 67. And the, and the real protest took a while to get started. So people, people were angry about it, and they were trying to stop it. Um, you know, but not before this was, this was destroyed. Uh, even so, the black community was mostly leaving before that, that point. It was really during the late 50s, early 60s when they were gearing up to go. And we're not moving into the McLean Park projects. They, weren't, they did not move there. And uh, that's the point where the black, the black community of Vancouver integrated. So if you have a friend come in from out of town who says, where are all the black people in Vancouver? And you say, well, they used to be there. And then uh, they knocked it down. And they these projects up and the black folks didn't move into them, they moved everywhere. They scattered all across the city. Um, but still, those numbers um, didn't get smaller, they got bigger, right? So it's not like the community evaporated or something like that. It's really the community integrated. Um, <clears throat> it's fine where I am here. So 
that's the Negro removal part in the states where, where our, our African American cousins are more sardonic and wittier. They called urban renewal Negro removal, right? Because they saw that happening over and over again. Um, in our case, uh, blacks remove themselves. And I think that, um, I mean, I've looked at the statistics really closely and tried to locate where there's another black locus. The closest thing is right where we are now, actually, in Mount Pleasant. And I think it's largely because of the new waves of African immigration. But otherwise, I mean, that, and that's really faint, there really is no black enclave in the Lower Mainland anywhere. And if you look at the map and you look at Stats Canada, it looks as if, you know, black folks were given a directive to live as far apart from other black folks as they possibly could. <laughs> And put the plan into action. It's really just spread out everywhere across the city. Um, you know, whether or not that's a good or bad thing, I, I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's better than being segregated, right? You have the right to live where you want to live. Uh, it, it has had some downsides to it. And one is, um, you know, the community is not recognized as existing. It's really ironic. If you look at the newspaper articles from the Hogan's Alley period, um, it's, it's pretty clear that um, Vancouverites were quite aware that they had a black population in the city. You know, they had all sorts of fucked up ideas about who they were, but they were aware that they were there, right? And if you look at today, you know, it's, uh, you know, you'll hear people say, how many people have you heard say, there are no black people in Vancouver? Yeah. You know, you would be a black person talking to somebody who would say to you, there are no black people in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, well, there there are there are more here now than there were back then, percentage-wise, right? So there are twenty thousand, more than twenty thousand black folks in Lower Mainland. Now it's not huge compared to other uh, uh, minority groups, but that's a lot of people. If all those people lived in one neighborhood, um, we'd have a whole bunch of things that we don't have right now, like a community center or some civic markers that we are in certain places. Um, we have some kind of remnants of whatever community had existed. I often say when people ask me, okay, if you're not against integration, um, then you know, what do you wish would have happened in a place like Hogan's Alley, right? So what would you have preferred? And I often say it's, you know, if, if things had been, if they hadn't destroyed it, if they left it alone and they, they let it just develop organically, uh, you know, even if they hadn't funded it or you know, tried to improve anybody's lives, if they just had left it alone, I think what you would have had in Hogan's Alley was something similar to um, what you have on Commercial Drive in terms of Little Italy, right? We, we know that Commercial Drive is, was Little Italy. Not a whole lot of Italians living there, right? But there's a lot of cafes and there's Il Mercato. There's things that, there's still institutions that are there that are remnants of uh, the time when it was an Italian enclave residentially, right? And I think that's sort of what you would have had there too. You still would have had certain places and certain institutions and chicken houses and um, whatever had evolved over the years, right? Um, I still think people would have integrated. I don't think you would have had um, maybe this kind of en masse really fast integration, but I think people gradually would have. But you still would have had this recognition that, yeah, the city has a black community. Yes, they used to live there, and everybody knows it, right? Um, what they took away from us with this with this freeway plan was, um, I think, that memory of the city as a black site, right? Um, that's why, you know, I persistently defend Black History Month as a fantastic institution and something that's really well suited to Vancouver. In a place where you don't have a physical site, we have this time of year, right, where people get together intentionally uh, at events like tonight and talk about this history. You know, if it weren't for this, it really would fade away. It really would be even more sporadic than it is. And so, um, um, another reason to, to thank the organizers for doing this. Um, so, people are there, they get together intentionally. Um, you know, we don't have, have uh, those sort of organic institutions that might have been there. But um, what I've been doing over the years, and a lot of other people have in various different ways, is trying to intentionally memorialize the community. So in, in 2002, I can't believe it's so long ago and we've gotten so little done, but in 2002, uh, I helped to establish a group called the Hogan's Alley Memorial Project, um, which originally we just, we just wanted there to be a plaque of some kind down there. There would be some marker that there was this black community there. But when we got into the work of it, we realized that um, a, a couple things. One, um, 
<clears throat> most Vancouverites, it seemed like, didn't even know that there was this black community that had been there. And so we realized, well, you know, wanting to get a plaque is one thing, but informing the people that this existed, that this was the history, um, became a large part of our task. And two, we didn't know that much about it. Right? So everybody in our group, um, nobody descended from uh, any of those original groups, although we ended up hooking up with people who did, uh, who, who came and did work with us. So the, the, um, the, the, sons, and, or the sons and daughters and, and grandsons and granddaughters of some of the elders uh, have also worked with us. So <coughs> we ended up being this kind of um, uh, information gathering group and sort of, I like to think of uh, uh, an activist group or sort of a, a pressure group to kind of keep the name Hogan's Alley in the media as much as possible, remind people that there is a black community here, there was a black community here, uh, it's around, and, uh, and trying to gather up whatever information there is um, out there. So. I'll show a few of those things now. So this is, so I'm jumping around a bit with these images. Um, for example, this is uh, an article from 1952. That's actually the, uh, one of the few pictures that we have of, of the black church in its time. Although it's not showing the church, it's taken from the top of the steps of the church, looking outward. And that's the Crump family there, and they're coming up the steps of the church. And this was an article Bruce Ramsey did. Every once in a while, if you read all the newspaper articles, you know, um, you know, about a, on a maybe a seven to ten year cycle, um, reporters kind of realize there's a black community and have some article that's like, hey, we have black people. Negroes live next door. And then uh, it sort of goes away for several years and then comes back and someone says, hey, there are black people here. And they write an article. About it. That's why Black History Month is good. It's, we've spent the cycle, right? And once it's a year now, it's not once in seven years. So um, it's a good thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one image of, uh, the other thing I like about this is that a lot of the photos of black folks in Hogan's Alley, not a lot of people had cameras back then, it seems like, when they did take photos, they're often interior shots, so it could be anywhere, but I like the fact that, you know, you see behind you the, salt, the, the Fall Street flats there, that's Prior Street, it kind of get, gives you an image of black folks in this city, right? Um, this is an image of uh, Bai's Chicken and Steakhouse. This is another example, right? Instead of having images, we have uh, you know, a, a, an artist's rendering of it. Um, so this is Keith McKellar's uh, drawing of, from a great book called Neon Eulogy, where he looks at different Vancouver sites, mostly in, uh, on the east side. Um, Vise was a very important institution, so it was the longest uh, running of those, those chicken and steak houses. Um, and uh, Vai's granddaughter is writing a biography of her, uh, her, her grandmother, so um, it'd be great to read that when it comes up. Amazing woman who had descended from the original black pioneers in Victoria, um, uh, ran a brothel there for a while, um, cashed out at a certain point, got out of the game, moved to Vancouver, used the money to buy, uh, buys, and was actually, I think, one of the only black uh, property owners in, in the Green Valley. Most people were renting. Um, and that's why. Yes. I'm a little confused. If you could go back to that the right there. Mm -hmm. So you said the African Canadian community lived largely over by Jackson. Mm -hmm. And you said the freeway construction largely wiped out the area opposite of Jackson. Right? Yeah. So where's the evidence of displacement? Yeah. becomes actually part of the highway destruction that Yeah, well, it was more the destruction to the neighborhood itself, right? That was, yeah, I'm sort of mixing up eras too. That was sort of a later era. If you go way back to the original black community, there were, there were a series of um, cabins that were here, right along this part, there were a bunch of uh, cabins. They were actually cited as the reason for the urban renewal plans, because they were uh, kind of a weird architecture compared to the rest of the neighborhood. Like there were these sort of single dwelling cabins, I guess, for, kind of for bachelors. They're, they're designed for. And that was where there was a kind of, that was a bit of a black part of Hogan Valley for a certain period. The Porter's quarters were there, Vise was there. So a lot of the businesses and things were down here. And then the church was here, and there was, there was an apartment building. But that's sort of a, a bit later, too. So there are different kind of overlapping eras. 
But like I said, I mean, the reason why black folks left, it really wasn't, a, it wasn't like Africa, right? It wasn't like people were all living there, the land was expropriated, and it was bulldozed, right? It wasn't like that. It was much more like the plans were instituted 10 years beforehand. People were um, given the message that this neighborhood is going down, right? Um, we're building these projects, and you're, you're going to live there, kind of thing. So people got out. It wasn't as though they were, you know, had the, their house uh, expropriated out from under them and bulldozed, right? It was more like people got out of their own accord. Do you want to just contextualize Africa? Yeah, I don't know if people know Africa. Well, I mean, I'm not an expert on Africa either. As I understand it, that was um, in Halifax. It was a black community that was, it, it was a pretty much faster expropriation as far as I know. Anyway. And it was um, taken over and what was put there? I think it just ended up being a vacant space yeah. for a long time. Yeah. It was supposed to be a roadway, some other kind of urban development that actually materialized. Yeah, yeah. It was the same idea, that same language of blight, right? Yeah. The, the neighborhood was a blight on the, on, the, on the civic body and had to be renewed in some kind of way, which meant knocked down and reformed. Um, the last little bit, just before I stop, um, is the why, and why is it important? I think um, partly, Talking about Hogan's Alley and remembering it knocks down several myths. One is that myth of black absence in the city, right? So yeah, folks are here. Um, you know, if you look at those numbers, it's it's a little bit less than one percent of the population. So if you think, well, you know, I don't see a lot of black people in the city, you have to sort of retrain your eyes, right? It's kind of like, well, look at a street scene. Uh, out of every hundred people who walk by, one of them is black. Does that sound a bit like Vancouver? Yeah, it does. Well, that's because that's how Vancouver is. <laughs> That's how it works. So the myth of black absence is something I'm always pushing against. Um, one of the things, I mean, there are more black folks in Greater Vancouver than there are in Nova Scotia. Right? And people don't believe me when I say that, but I'll send you to Stats Canada to look at the numbers, right? So um, there are a lot of folks here. It's just a very big city with a lot of other people here too. So. And, and to region. your point too, Nova Scotia has held on to the historical presence. Yeah, it's older. It's older presence. It's very rooted, uh, more homogenous in certain ways, and so it's been. We know well. And I'm not sure that's, that that's true. Everyone knows this black community there, but I think they have a higher profile nationally than we do. That's for sure. Um, another myth that it knocks down is is the myth of black ahistoricality. That you know blacks haven't been here for you know, a long time. <clears throat> when blacks have been here, you know, from before this was a, a, a province, right, in the, in the colonial days, all the way up, including in Vancouver. So some of the first black folks who were here were, were uh, here at the very beginning, right? So there are blacks all through the history. Um, there are different waves of immigration, that's true, and there's some sort of, uh, you know, waves and then recessions, but, uh, but they've been here all along. So that's another myth that knocks down. The other is this uh, this whole Vancouverism. Uh, that Vancouver is this model of urban planning, um, this sort of self-congratulatory, let's all pat each other on the backs for how wonderful Vancouver is and how horrible all those other cities are that did those terrible things to people. You know, it's like I, um, you know, I'm always saying, if you read like Douglas Copeland talk about Vancouver, he says something like, you know, Vancouver never lost its innocence because it never put a freeway into the city and so on and so forth, right? Well, I want to debunk that. That's not true. There was a community that paid the price for this. We did have urban renewal here, and it did mess with people for years and years and years and make their lives really hard and eventually you know, push this one community out altogether. So um, it was a pernicious plan. It did happen here, and it was the same as everywhere else. So there's nothing really particularly wonderful about Vancouver's urban planning history at all. Um, and that leads up to my last point, which is that uh, where we're sort of left with. So often when people ask me about Hogan's Alley and they ask, you know, what should be done down there now? You know, what do you think the community should be like now? And um, <coughs> um, the answer is, is pretty simple. It's the same thing that should have happened then, which is, you know, the, the people who live there now, not the people who own there or the, the, the people who are speculating there, you know, or anything like that, but the people who live there are the experts on what should happen in that place, right? So the people who live there now, in you know, what used to be called Hogan's Alley, we now talk about as the downtown east side, um, 
the, you know, the, the parallels are very clear between uh, how that neighborhood is, is spoken about now and how the, the slum of Hogan's Alley was spoken about uh, back then. Right? It's the same kind of uh, uh, um, othering voice that talks about uh, uh, this community uh, as though they're a problem that we need to figure out what to do with, right? And really the answer is, well, the people down there know what should be done to their neighborhood. Like, they are the experts on what should happen to their neighborhood. Consult with them. That's everybody who lives there. People renting there, people who are sleeping on the streets there. Um, people who are using that neighborhood are the ones that should decide what should happen down there. That's what didn't happen uh, during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and that's why we had the situation that, that destroyed this community. Now, it's no longer real, the black community at all, right? So that's not... Um, the claim that we have on it is really this historical claim. So I'm pushing for some kind of memorial in, in physical form down there. There are a few things in play and things have happened. I used to say, you know, there's no marker down there that, was, that there was ever a black community. And now that, that's changed. I can't say that any, anymore. There's the, the Jimi Hendrix Shrine is there. It's a very eccentric, very Vancouver memorial. Um, and there's uh, very, very recently the Hogan's Alley Cafe right at the corner of Gore and Union. So there's the name, the name is down there now. So um, there are some things there. Now, I'd like there to be something more official and uh, something that's maybe interpretive that gives some sense of the history. So we'll keep pushing for that. I think some things are in play. There's, um, you know, there's stuff happening. So I, I feel like we've, we've hit that critical mass of, of uh, of educating people, and that people kind of know about the history, and there, there, there's some things happening that I think within the next few years there will be some memorial there uh, in some kind of form. So um, that's great. Um, but uh, I, you know, the other thing too is to is to continue, you know, talking about it and keeping it as a living history. So sometimes I know that somebody said that you know the the thing about. Uh, memorials are is that they allow us to forget about something, right? And I, and I hope that's not the case. I hope it's it's it's. Uh, I hope we can, can can continue to connect up the the past to what's going on now. I think the previous speakers are a good example of that. So you know, we recognize that racism still happens. It still happens against black people. It still happens in very particular ways against black people. Um, and we and we hear those scripts being replayed over and over again, and we have to continue to fight them. Um, things have changed. It's a different world. It's not the exact same demographic. Um, things have moved around a bit, but there are some fundamental issues that we still face, and uh, we have to continue fighting them. You know, my role in that right now is to is to fight for this memory. So um, I'll continue to do that. I'll stop by just showing you one photograph. I, I hadn't seen this photograph until uh, Sunday night. So at uh, East End Blues and all that jazz, which is uh, the Vancouver Movie Theater, did a wonderful uh, show that um, had the voices of some of the original um, residents of, of Hogan's Alley, the elders from the black community, um, uh, created this, this fantastic review. It's kind of like a cabaret history uh, of the community. Um, that's over now. It, was the, it ran on Sunday night. But um, Chick Gibson, who was there, who was narrating it, uh, shared with us this image. So I took this from the program. But this is an image of the, the congregation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church around 1935 uh, at a picnic at, uh, at Stanley Park. And when I saw this, I was just like, that, you know, that's it right there. That's the kind of thing that we're, we're trying to keep, um, keep alive, right? The memory that this, this is Vancouver, right? Um, and folks dressed very nicely. <laughs> um, so maybe now I'll open it up to questions and maybe we can have a bit of a discussion. Wait, I just want to say, about the Stanley Park picture, um, hi everybody, um, my name is Vanessa. My family, I grew up in the city, as you well, and I know our family, the Caribbean community, in Stanley Park, the cricket matches used to look like that, and we used to have that many black people in Stanley Park playing still kind of cricket. But Anybody that, take a picture? I know, I was thinking, gosh, I don't think we have one, but I, I think I'm going to have to make a little digging around for that. But what this shows me is, I mean, that, that's the other thing, the archive, this stuff is not in the city archives, right? There's some stuff there, but... Where it is right now is in it's in family albums and in people's attics and things like that. I'm, just, I'm terrified things will get lost. You can see this is really a damaged photo, right? But so I'm just you know 
that keeps me awake. Right? It's thinking of what gets <laughs> tossed out or thrown away or forgotten about. First of all, this is really great. This is very enlightening. But um, I have a question. You can one of them just answer about stuff being archived, obviously not. Um, <coughs> I'm just kind of going back to the centennial, which happened in 86, quite a long time now. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking that none of this was documented at that time. Um, I, I don't know, like you, you just said, I was curious as to, is any of this in the municipal archives, and if so, why isn't it being implemented yet in the curriculum? At yeah. that time it wasn't. So like looking at maybe 2036, or just the halfway point, you know, getting this stuff in the curriculum is, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. It seems like the, in terms of curriculum, it seems like the stuff about the black pioneers from Victoria, from the gold rush, that that's that's entered first or something like that. I'm, I'm, I've done a couple talks at high schools where I'm talking about that kind of stuff. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know we did a section on that. Okay, like, really? Well, that's not in my right? Um, so it's like, you know, um, maybe that was a special class teacher. Um, but it does seem like that's that's a little more well known and that's kind of entered and maybe this is the next next thing. But, um, in terms of the archives, I mean I know the archives are very open to acquiring this kind of stuff and we it's a funny thing that like, in our group we at a certain point one of the members in the group, Sh um, Sheila Cahill, was saying, you know, we went to the archives, couldn't find much stuff, and she was saying, you know, they're not looking hard enough. There's like there's stuff in the back. There's stuff they've got in boxes back there that they just haven't found. There's something there in the black community. There's gotta be, right? And I was like, there's not stuff in the back. It's not a conspiracy. They're not trying to like keep it from us. They're archivists. If they got a picture, they'll put it up. And she's like, no, no, they're, they're not looking hard enough for it. And so she was, her prompting, really, we wrote a letter to them saying, well, we're this group. We're hoping you have material in the black community. We, we have very, very little. And so I was more thinking just to get them to think about acquiring stuff, right? And. Um, and then it took a while, it was about a year later, and they wrote back to me, and they said, well, you know, we got your letter, we were thinking about it, and you know, we, we looked through our files, and we found a box in the back. <laughs> I swear to you. And, it, and it, was the, it was the images from the expropriation, it was the city's photographs that they took of the, of the, um, the buildings that were extant in the late 60s um, to price them, and they found this huge, Thing, right? So I was like, Sheila, you're right. <laughs> looking hard enough. So, you know, so now I'm like, you know. But anyway, they were, they've also put up a big section on, on uh, African Canadian stuff. They've actually, co at that, before then, it was really hard to find stuff because nothing was organized by the community. It was just you already had to know a person's name to find an image of some black person. And now, now that's, it's easier to find. You can go looking for the black community, but they still don't have a lot of stuff. So. People in the always recognize their alcohol, they live in it, they have families and friendships, and that's what constitutes their culture. And it yeah. the person who actually wants to be the folklorist or the archivist to put them together and make some kind of document of that, like Bud Delvey, who's a guitarist, but he also had a radio show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true, and I think you know, very light-skinned, not a member of that particular community. Um, my dad came as an immigrant in, in the 50s, didn't live down there, um, an academic. You know, a few steps removed from all of that stuff, and I think that's partly, it, it takes a person who's kind of thinking of it in those cultural terms and not just like their family's history sometimes. Although, there are people who, who've hooked up with us who are within the community, from the community, who were, who were activists during that period, and they're much more interested in, in, in thinking culturally about it collectively as this, Well, I was just going to say I'm probably the oldest person in the room. And I was born in Vancouver uh, in 1945. And, uh, and I didn't know anything about Hogan Valley. Um, the only black person I ever heard about was Joe Ford. Joe Ford. Because he, well, my mom called him Joe Ford. He taught her to swim down at English Bay. When she came out from Winnipeg in see she was eight so that would have been in uh, 1916 they moved here from Winnipeg Joe Ford taught her to swim and that was I mean as far as I knew 
until I went to university and, and spent a lot of my time at international house with the, with the Caribbean students, right? Yes. I mean, that was the only black image that was in Vancouver. Um, and until the, so that would be in the in the 60s or early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of Caribbean students then. And, and that's when, the, as far as my life is concerned, that's when there were blacks in Vancouver. Yeah, so, you get, it's funny, you get things like in um, Rosemary Brown's autobiography, she talks about you know coming to the city with her husband in the 50s. And you know, there's this big chunk of the autobiography where they're just like trying to rent from places, experiencing all this racism, trying to figure Vancouver out, and they're just like, this is so weird, there's no black people in the city, it's bizarre. And then they, you know, for years, they, they bump into um, uh, a, couple, uh, a black couple and realize there's Hogan's Alley. They realize there's this East End black community that they had no idea it was there. So yeah, it's possible. And it's where you are, the circles you're in. Thank you, that was awesome. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you have any answers to this, but um, I'm wondering if there's any specific stories or histories that you know of of the black community's relationship to other communities of color, mm -hmm. particularly indigenous communities. And mm -hmm. it's not an easy answer. And you know, particularly hearing some of the Chinese elders talk about some of the different stories of the Chinese community's relationship to indigenous communities in particular. So during the race riots. Um, there's a lot of untold stories of the Musqueam and Squamish taking in a lot of folks from Chinatown during the race riots. But at the same time, a lot of conflict around the, the lane of the railroads, of course. And so, I don't know if there's stories in the black community or particularly around Hogan Valley of the relationship to Chinatown or the Musqueam and Squamish, or um, particularly the relationship with James Douglas, I guess. Yeah, well, we, we, yeah, in terms of BC, it's a big, big question. Yeah. But maybe I'll just talk about Vancouver specifically. I mean, it's kind of, it, it's a really interesting question, and it's kind of one of the, the untold sides of this story, right? Is that, you know, that proximity to Chinatown, there's a whole lot of interaction with Chinese folks. I know Nora Hendricks talks about it kind of jokingly, you know, about trying to cook soul food by shopping in Chinatown. You know, and, and it can be done, right? And, um, you know, things like that. I'd love to have some of those recipes. See, these are the things that get lost. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interaction. Um, and you look at, there's a photograph of the congregation, not this one, a later one, of the, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. It has some Asian faces there. So you're like, you know, who, you know I'd love to know who these people are and what these interactions were like. But um, it's just kind of here and there sporadically. And in terms of First Nations people, this is another one of those stories that I just, I, I, I can't figure out where I heard this. I have the memory of it now. I can't remember if I read it somewhere or if somebody told it to me. But um, somebody um, said that uh, Vanier Park, like where um, the, uh, what do you call thing? The, uh, planetarium <laughs> is, right? That that used to be called Brownstone Beach when Kitts was with, so different sites were segregated. Like Vancouver wasn't segregated as a city, but sites were, and Kitts Beach was. So black folks and native folks couldn't go to swim. Probably Asians couldn't either. And, um, and so they would go there. What was left of the beach was there at Vanier Park, and it was called Brownskin Beach, because that's where you know, Indians and black folks would go swim. Um, I wish I could corroborate that, but you know, it's one of those things you hear, and you know, I should have written down where that was, or who told me that. But, I haven't heard anything since. If anybody knows anything more about that, let me know. But yeah, it was such a mixed neighborhood. Yeah. James Douglas is a good story. That's a whole yeah, it's a long story. Yeah. What age did uh, Jimmy Hendrix live in Vancouver for? For how long? Yeah, he was, he, he was, he was here sporadically. It was kind of like, it sounds like, I mean, his parents were pretty bad alcoholics and had lots of problems. And um, it sounds like when they, when things completely broke down in Seattle, his dad would send him up to Vancouver to live with Nora. And so he was never here for a really long, uh, uninterrupted stretch of time. He was here long enough to go to school here. He went to elementary school for, for a while. Um, so it was kind of, you know, it would be a portion of a school year, that kind of thing. So uh, 
Yeah, mostly as a kid when he was little. Right? And, um, and then later on as a, as a young man, we would start playing music and stuff like that. They would play up here. So we did a bunch of shows here before he hit it really huge, right? And um, there's stories of him playing the Smiling Buddha and places like that. So he was here, but it wasn't really like this was his hometown. It was more like, you know, he so slept here. And Laura Hendricks is such a notable person in the community. For what reason was she? I think because she was one of those people who, who was, her life really spans the, the whole history of the period. Like she was really here kind of at the beginning of it, very, very early. She was here at the foundation of the church, helped to establish it, and then was here all throughout, and stayed in the East End. Like she was there right up into her last days. They did take her to Seattle because she had no more family left here. She outlived everybody. So they took her down to Seattle to die, but that's it. Apparently, on her deathbed, she was saying, okay, I gotta get better so I can go back home to Canada. And um, <clears throat> so she was in, you know, she was in Strathcona, uh, right up to the end. So she's sort of this person who just saw everything, just this repository of all the information of the community. 